do is so wonderful about um, sharing all of her YouTube tricks and everything. And we did a little lunch the other day and she shared an app that I have already used three or four times. Sue, would you be willing to tell us what that app is? Oh yeah, sure. Um, it is called, let me try to find it on my phone now. Yeah, it's just one where you can quickly do a net sheet for either a buyer or seller on the fly on your phone. It's called Palm Agent, P-A-L-M Agent. And it's really cool because it's specific to your actual state, your county. It knows the taxes. Um, it puts in the deed stamps, the attorney fees. I mean, it's, it's really cool. And then you can email it to yourself to print it. Because yeah. at first I didn't think you could print it, but, and it looks really nice when you print it. It looks like you spent a lot of time on it. <laughs> <It's pretty, laughs> people are, they're impressed with it. It takes like one minute. That's awesome. No, I've used it a few times already and it's good. Been so thanks so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm a well, podcast junkie and I learned tricks like that from listening to all these different podcasts. So, well, anyway. that's what it's all about. You listen and, yeah. you share and then we all learn and nobody had to listen to the same podcast. That's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are so excited. Erica, we have got Erica Grigowski on. You are the director of operations for the Cox team down here in Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, you guys do a ton of stuff with military moves and you've got a pretty diverse background with MBA and all kinds of great stuff. So I would love for you to introduce yourself and take it over. Right. Uh, good morning. Like she said, my name is Erica Grigowski. I have been dabbling in real estate probably for about, I don't know, eight, -ish, eight or so years, uh, seriously. I was a realtor for about three years in the beginning. Stephanie Cox, our team leader, actually got me into it um, as a military spouse the first time we were stationed here. And I've always owned rental properties. I bought my first house when I was 22 during the market crash of 08. So that was fantastic. I learned a lot there. Um, swore I'd never buy another house again after that. It was miserable had a short sale, everything like that. And then um, followed my husband around for about 10 years and we finally have landed here. And since then we've accidentally acquired other real estate. So, so much for saying never on that one and have um, finally settled here. I took the job with Stephanie about a, almost a year ago now when my husband retired from the military and we've just been slowly uh, growing and structuring the team over here on Monson Street. And I have my master's in business operations. Um, Allison will tell you that I actually got into real estate to pay for my master's in cash once my GI bill ran out. So that was a really important goal for me. I hit it hard and then I quit. So that was my goal. I transitioned over to the lending side for a little while. I was a loan assistant. That's where I met Melanie Ott with Gateway Mortgage. She was a loan assistant with me for a little while at the same company. And then I actually owned and ran a restaurant of which I sold last year in Vermont and have since transitioned down here. So a lot of operations experience, a lot of running businesses, selling businesses, finding people's value and cost per hour and all that kind of stuff. So it's been really a journey to help our team members find that value for themselves. So um, today I've been invited to talk to you guys about the personal intrinsic value and uh, flipping the script in real estate. A lot of times we talk about scripting and rehearsing and all of that stuff. And today I am going to encourage you to think of that script in a different way. So we will kick it off. So a lot of times here in our office, we are trying to you know, overcome the boundaries or the hurdles of people saying, well, why am I paying you when I went under contract on day one, right? Hopefully hopefully that that's how it works for everyone, right? And we say, you pay me for my efficiency or my experience, not my time, right? So what, is, what does that mean in general? I think for me, like when I hear, we're getting challenged a lot on, on our value, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of agents that have just come into the market and there's a lot of competition in the market over the last three to five years. And so um, 
hearing you say that just now, I was like, oh, I really like that script actually. Cause it was a little bit more poignant way of saying like, well, I'm the best and you pay me because I'm, I'm the best. Right. And so I think sometimes being able to articulate that value, um, without just throwing a comp or a stat in front of somebody is really important. Yeah. And we use this a lot with, um, the personal guilt sometimes we have the personal guilt of feeling like, and I, and Kinsey's online, we've said this, you know, she's our transaction coordinator. She might be done for the day. And we're like, why, why are you still here? Like go home. So we're paying Kinsey, you know, a salary for her efficiency. And so I hope she's okay with me saying that, but we don't pay her to sit in a chair all day long and, you know, just wait to go home at 5 PM. Um, so we really are trying to harness that and, pared down and automate systems so that people can work with their clients more efficiently, have those proper boundaries set up and, you know, of, of work less hours, right? The, le the more efficient you are, the less hours you work, the higher your cost per hour is, right? So um, when your knowledge in your area of your occupation from goes from providing a service to providing value, and both of these things can be true. Um, you're earning based off of your experience, your skill, your efficiency. So we're all providing a service, but when we provide that value to a client, that's when they really connect with us. That's when we build that relationship. So when people can tell you, oh, I know a guy, or I have a friend that can totally help you. She's really good at this. Hopefully that's happening in a good way. Um, so you should consider yourself as arrived at that moment when someone rattles your name off above everybody else that they know, right? You might've heard people say, oh, I know a lot of realtors, right? How do you become that person that they recommend? And I know that Anna has talked about this previously and, you know, that's where we strive to be is how do we become, become so valuable that we get on that I know a guy list? Um, so we just talked about value and that word I feel gets thrown around a lot in sales. It's used so much right now that it's, you know, sometimes it's cliche. It's like, oh, I, what value do I provide? And we're breaking our necks, you know, all hours of the night, responding to texts from worried borrowers or navigating the emotions of, of sellers who really don't want to sell, but maybe they're PCSing or maybe they have to move back to help their parents or whatever their story is. We absorb all of those emotions and then we have to sit down in our computer and just write a blanket professional email pairing, pairing down all of those emotions to a request or a statement for, you know, the agent on the other side, really being that buffer. And sometimes you're a punching bag, right? So the value of being that resource, navigating those emotions, like I said, and then also being a central location for your clients for appraisers and surveyors, being that connection to everyone, essentially being the middleman that gets it all done and scheduled, you know, to your vendors, providing, you know, services that are needed to get all the way to the closing table. Um, you even sometimes have to deal with people who aren't a part of the transaction, like the father and his daughter's like the first time home buyer and he wants to get in there because he's a carpenter and he wants to make sure his daughter's getting a good deal. How, how do you navigate that professionally, you know, in a setting where the transaction's already moving forward, daddy, you know, I'm, I'm we're here. But yeah. Let's get in and let's provide that, provide that value and give everybody the service level that they, that they want. So how do we overcome all of that? Um, now when you combine all of that information, all of those services, that value that you're providing. Now you add that to three or four or five contracts a month, right? We all want to be successful agents. We all want to actually have an income at the end of the year, not just expenses, but you, how do you do that without sacrificing your boundaries? And that's where your personal intrinsic value, your hard stop comes in. Does anybody have a personal story about running three or four or five contracts and feeling like they all of their boundaries are just shot? I'm gonna do like that. Our friend last week did. I'm gonna smoke you out. So I'll sit here. 
I, I, text at 11 p.m. Yeah, I can tell you, I mean, especially in the beginning, and it's why I kind of created the team, right, was because that was my life for years, and it was exhausting. And when you started talking about the dad, that's the carpenter, that said, I want to go and see the house. And it's like, but we've already got under contract. It's already appraised. We've already done everything. Like, and now, you know, it's almost like this anxiety came in me because- <laughs> you know, I want to be a people pleaser. I want to make you happy. But I also know that, you know, now we've got somebody about to come and torpedo the deal. And I've got to somehow keep the buyer, the listing agent happy and the sellers understand that we're good. And it, it does feel strange. It, it, it stresses you out because you want to keep everything in line. And there's so many, there's so many parts of being a realtor that a lot of us can't juggle all of those personalities, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when you said dad as a carpenter, I was like, oh my God, I've been there. And when dad asked to come, you want to melt. And so I guess my question is like, how do you navigate that? Especially for agents that are starting to juggle five, six, seven transactions at a time. When you've got one, you can kind of do it. When you've got five, it it's hard. Yeah. So what do you do? Muddle through it. <laughs> you to, right. You, that dad is, is there as a part. Ultimately that dad can make or break the deal. You know that. And that's why we worry about it. So how can we approach it in a way that we gain that person's trust, that we assure them that everything will be okay, that we have a pocket of people down here, ready, willing, and able to help and come to, you know, their aid whenever is necessary you know and we we say those things what is the extra stuff you can provide well we're dad we're going to have a home warranty so she just calls this number and she pays 50 bucks or whatever and you know her refrigerator part will be fixed and all of the things so what are those extra reassurances that you can give someone with such a strong relationship to that buyer that you know if they say this ain't it they're out no matter what the cost it is because dad will pay that, you know, termination fee or that earnest money loss, he'll replace that. So we, we know that that's like a strong, a strong person in that moment in time, even if you are halfway through a transaction. Um, who looks at their phone at like 6, 7 p.m. when it's ringing and it's on silent, but it's ringing and you're like, oh, and then you answer and you're like, hi, this is Anna. Or... <laughs> you like chase the lead because you're in a slump and you're worried that July's numbers aren't quite up there yet. So I need to get July's numbers up there. So then you find out that you lost that lead because, oh, we were just, you know, driving around this weekend and we signed with a new build because they had really great, you know, incentives. So, oh, sorry. I didn't know that that was relevant to you. They said that they would take care of it. Does anybody ever have that happen to them? or that you lost a listing because you text that person regularly. You're kind of friends and maybe your kids go to gymnastics together. So you're always talking while you're waiting. And then you find out they listed their house and they're like, oh, that's right. You are a realtor. That's right. Oh, oh, well, I mean, we already started the process. So anybody ever have that? Yeah, super frustrating, super frustrating. Probably go home, vent in whatever way it is you vent. But these cry. Are all <laughs> cry, be mad, threaten to delete their phone number. Um, hope that they step on a Lego. That's our, that's our thing in the house. Um, super, super frustrating, but all learning experiences, right? What do we learn from rolling our eyes at 6 p.m.? What can we take away from that? Is it because... We are so peopled out during the day because maybe we're not as structured as we want to be. Is it because we are answering the phone at 6 p.m. because we didn't set the proper expectations originally? Um, what do we learn from the buyers that signed with a new build? Anyone? Well, I'll hop in. Yeah. So I, I, this actually just happened this week. Um, it was, it was this weekend, actually an agent called on Zillow and, you know, the, the, the classic Zillow call. And she said, Hey, I want to look at this listing. And it was our listing. And I said, okay, great. And 
old me, right. Would have been like, what time do you want to be there? I'll be there in five minutes. Da, 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 da. Well, I was busy and I said, let's, let's qualify. So I went through the whole qualifying thing, but she wanted to see this one house and she wanted to see this one house. So I got her in, I started texting her, come to find out she was going to look at five other houses with five listing agents. And that's when I really, it's like you said, the the dad with the carpenter, right? It It's like, do I just go and show up and say, look, I'm going to be the best agent out of the five and I'm going to earn her business because I'm cuter and smarter and, and funnier and all the things. And my learning lesson, and it's, this is what you're teaching right now, right? Was no. Does she understand agency? Does she understand what she's you know, going to look at and who she's talking to? And the answer, Erica, was no, she didn't. And so five years ago, I would have run, got in that car, stopped what I was doing, gotten out of my yoga pants, put mascara on, met her at the house and been one of five that wasted my time on a Saturday or a Sunday to show her a house. Instead, I qualified her. And at the end of that really awkward conversation to say, hey, ma'am, do you know agency? Do you know what you're doing here? She said, you provided me more value in the last five minutes than out of all of the phone calls I've had with other agents. We ended up not seeing the house. I ended up not having to work on a Saturday and we now have agency and come to find out most of those other agents were calling the new builds, registering that client. And the client went in and called and said, I have agency with this agent and I, I'm not registered with those other agents. And so it did take that uncomfortable, like, don't rush to just stop what I'm doing to go provide this service. Because I think in our heads, we convince ourselves that that's what we need to do. But I think sometimes it's leveling up and having the skills to have a conversation with them. And it actually saved me my weekend. Right. So the, but that only comes from experience, right? So we can say all day long, don't touch that hot burner. Don't touch that hot burner. Don't touch that hot burner because it's hot and you'll get burned. Eventually, whether you're listening or not, you're going to accidentally touch the hot burner or even on purpose, touch the hot burner. And you'll be like, yeah, I'm never going to do that again. Right. That's, you know, we teach, we, I feel like we've all learned that lesson literally in our lives. So you've learned from experience, your years of experience that qualifying that is super awkward and painful, but that's the value that you provide. You have the information, the tools and the script to say, Hey, this, this is how it should be. And it ultimately is easier for her because she doesn't have to reiterate to four other people after you. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And ultimately waste her own time. So you saved her, her own time and your own time by laying it out making it efficient, making it structured, laying the foundation. Um, the hardest part of all of these experiences is that we grow from the challenge. We grow from the pit, right? So whenever any of these moments happen, it's a pit. We fall in, we have to climb back out, whether it's a really large learning experience or just something like, I think I'll do it differently this next time around. The most you can, the most value you'll ever get is through direct experience, through the thoughtful stories that you pack away. You might even in three years when you're brushing your teeth, like cringe in the mirror because you thought of something you did three years ago that was illegal and you didn't even know it was illegal. And you're like, oh my God. And so that's the first thing you tell your new agents or anyone who's trying to get into real estate. You're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And it, and it sits with you. Um, and these are the things that we we all teach our mentees. It's what our mentors try to pass down to us. And some of you probably are in here like, okay, cool. Well, Erica, I haven't closed any deals yet. I'm super new. Or I've only closed one. So this is all, all irrelevant to me at this moment. And so I would challenge you to say that that's the perspective that we choose to have. Um, what we choose to see in a problem or we can see the problem or your previous closing as a puzzle and we have to actively work through it to get to the other side. What could you improve? So one thing I've started doing with my own kids at night, and I actually got this from the book, The Power of Moments. It's what did you do? What's one highlight today? I'm sure some of you have done this with other people. Like what's your high for the day and what's your low for the day? We've changed that in our household to say what, did you do wrong today? What did you fail at today? And they have to think of something, you know, well, I misspelled three words on my spelling test, something super small or 
Sometimes it's like, I got really angry and I didn't share or something like that. And how do we overcome that? And so whether you've had one closing or no closings, what can you do to make your time of day more efficient? What can you learn and take away from that one closing that you definitely will be doing better next time? Because every closing, what's easy? What's hard? What are you taking away from it? And what are you going to share next time with someone else who's getting into real estate? Right? Um, any questions there? Any stories that you have from your very first transaction? I know we've got some few agents on and um, I think, you know, obviously in the morning, everyone's always like timid. Yeah. 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 But I, I would love if somebody wanted to jump in. I think that the, the coolest experience about this is like hearing people's fails. And what you're saying is it's not sitting at the table saying, what'd you do good today? It's like, what did you learn today? What did you do negative that maybe we could change? Because if we only focus on our positives, that's great. And like, we're all patting ourselves on our back, but we grow so much from our negatives. So who do we have that wants to maybe say some experiences or things that they could have changed or done or whatever? I can share um, something that occurred on my first transaction. Perfect. Please do. I was representing, um, sorry, I'm driving. <laughs> I was representing the, the buyer. And when I went to do the inspection, I didn't share with the listing agent that I was doing the inspection that day. And when we went out there to do the inspection, the water was off. Mm. I think if I would have shared with the listing agent that I was going out there, he could have told me that the water was off and it wouldn't be turned back on until Tuesday. So I had to actually, um, we, we did the inspection. We continued the inspection that day, but we had to go back out and complete it once the water was back on. So the lesson I learned was communicate with the listing agent. I think communication is important. I've learned that after that, you have to communicate everything with the other agent. That's great. And I know you're probably like, oh my gosh, I like, how did that happen? That happened to me. I have done that. I have been there. I'm pretty sure most people on this call have done. I've done it before where we pulled up and there was no electricity. There was no water. And I remember the first time I did that, the, the inspector made me pay for the inspection. Like it wasn't a, yeah, girl, I know you're going to be a great realtor one day and you're going to send me a ton of inspections. He was like, I'm being paid for my time and I can't inspect anything. So I remember that was like my first $300 mistake. Um, and then the second one was I had to buy a washer dryer because I didn't put it into the contract. Yeah. Let's take a poll. How many washer dryers have been purchased in this group? <laughs> Raise your hand if you bought a washer or dryer. <laughs> really nice ones too. Not like, not like used ones off of Facebook marketplace. No, no Facebook marketplace. That doesn't work. I tried that one. I think Amanda had raised her hand and she had something to share. I just wanted to share some feedback. So on my first deal, which actually just closed recently, uh, a lot like the other example, just communication and making sure everybody's on the same page. In this case, it was a remote closing and they were in uh, West Coast time and just making sure everybody was on the same page um, issue came up with somebody not realizing that it was a remote closing and just making sure, you know, had to make a couple real quick phone calls to get everybody back on the same page very quickly. But as much as I thought I was going in, having everybody on the same page, one person didn't realize it. And sure enough, it, it, kind of caused a little bit of a ripple. So got it fixed real quickly, but just making sure everybody is all on the same page was pretty, pretty key. So yeah, my, so small my very first, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to say my very first listing, I had prospected for it. They'd kept the note card in their drawer for like 60 days or something. You know, it was like that, like fairy tale story of an agent's first listing, right? My aunt had actually like built the house. So like I had a personal tie to it. It's in my hometown. And I was very acutely aware that there was a road that was slated to go near that property um, on the adjacent lot. Um, mm -hmm. And and we did make mention of it, you know, in our remarks, but we didn't explore much more than that. The first buyer got their survey back and the road went through the garage of my first listing. So 
that required me then to be in multiple town meetings. I mean, when I talk about, I learned things so fast, I cannot even begin to explain what I learned on that first listing. Like literally these people found out as their contract was being terminated and they were under contract to purchase another home that literally their garage was, you know, the, the path for a, a phantom road in our, our town. In fact, I sit on a transportation committee board now, just because of this road, I complain about it all the time. But, um, you know, it was one of those where I think like it made me a much better agent. So early on, because I dealt with legit trauma, like straight trauma, you know, and like had to take responsibility. I felt like that was way above what I needed to do. I shouldn't have been in a town meeting with the town manager talking about the legality of a road being on the books with no funding, you know, like, but it really did. It was so good because it showed me early on, like it's such a comprehensive job. Um, and sometimes our job is to go sit there with the town manager and talk about, you know, transportation issues. And it is to, to then turn around and be an emotional therapist to this family who doesn't know what they're going to do now, because they are literally at a place where they feel like there's no path forward. Um, and then having to, to figure out how do we reposition the house on the market? How do we, how, and we did, we ultimately got it sold to somebody that was from town that knew the road was never going in. They signed a very formal agreement, you know, at closing that they would, they understood the implications of buying the home as is, but it was one of those where I remember being like, why did this happen to me? But now looking back, I'm so thankful that that was my first listing experience. Um, Cause I think it really did. You, you learn so much from the problems. You don't learn from the ones that go well. And I'll tell you this, you don't get a lot of referrals off the ones that go well either. You get a ton of your referral business off of the problem children. So I always tell my team, I'm like, be thankful for your problem children transactions, because those are the ones that impactfully are going to you know, be there in your business year after year, because they're going to be so thankful that they saw that value, that they, they were there. So it feels unfair to us sometimes when we're, we're going through transactions and it seems like the cards are stacked against us, but just remember that the output from that is going to be so much bigger because that person is going to remember all of the things that you handled for them. The easy peasy ones, we don't get referrals off of those who aren't able to show what we do, you know? Yeah. I was just going to kind of chime in. Sorry, I was chasing a teenager earlier, so we may have touched on this, but a lot of what our team is, is still managing our excitement. So this isn't even a new agent story. This is a, this happened to me this weekend story. I have one of my very first residential listings, super excited. I'm emotionally involved. The guy's my friend. You know, I get a call from an agent after a showing. She's so excited. She's like, I'm going home. I'm writing an offer. And me and my excitement, I call my client and I'm like, it's coming. It's coming. 24 hours. It's still no offer. 36 hours, still no offer. I'm texting the listing agent and she's like, it's in his inbox. I don't know. And Sunday evening at five o'clock, she calls me and she's like, buyer got cold feet. Sorry about your luck. And I, in the meantime, have ex overly excited my seller. I'm overly excited. And the biggest thing I think that we focus on is managing our, um, our own emotions so that we can manage them for our clients. I should have handled that completely differently. And I know now, but you know, my poor friend is getting to experience my mistake. And that's okay, because we're turning it around. You know, we're learning from those pits and peaks and those monumental moments will stick with us for a very long time um, and create that sense of neutrality when it comes to managing those emotions, right? Like. I took and I spoke with Amanda and I went around with this and I was like, we got to harness the old skeptical Amanda, right? Mm -hmm. We've been, we've been building Amanda up to be the, the air of positivity on the team. And I'm like, bring back the skeptical Amanda for certain things. And that is like one of those, I'll believe it when I see it situation. So that was a really fun conversation to have with Amanda. Um, so basically no closing, no client, no family investor, or anything, any transaction will ever be the same, right? But isn't every transaction also basically the same? So that's where we come in with the script and how to flip it. And so last week we talked about in our team meeting, the hotel where the family leaves the hotel, they go home and their four-year-old is distraught because he left his favorite stuffy at the hotel and he will not sleep without it. 
chaos is ensuing, all of the things, the dad obviously comes in with the lie and says, oh, the stuff he's still still on vacation. Jeffrey's still on vacation. And so he calls the hotel thinking, you know, whatever, they trashed it. And they didn't trash it. They even sent him an iPhone picture of the stuffy in a lawn chair by the pool. So this is the story that comes directly out of the book, The Power of Moments. And so they agree to mail it back. And so the dad's expecting to get, you know, a flat rate box in the mail and stuffy Jeffrey stuffed in there. But instead, they get a box in the mail with a photo album full of pictures of Jeffrey, the stuffy all over the city those days and, you know, wearing sunglasses and eating, you know, a nice dinner and all that kind of stuff. So it was really impactful for the family to not only get their $2 stuffy back that had so much intrinsic value to this four-year-old that they also took the time to gather him around the city and create a little vacation photo album for Jeffrey the Stuffy. So that flipped the script on what you would normally feel should be a regular old, I put it in the mail, have a nice day, hope to see you again soon, to those people probably have a lot of loyalty now to that company, whatever hotel, whatever hotel it was. They created a peak out of a situation that was less than ideal out of, you know, my son won't sleep because of this. And if any of you have kids or if you have family with kids and they're like, we're not coming out because we didn't get any sleep last night, you can imagine, you know, how this family was feeling. And they that company completely flipped it around for them. Um, so we also have other things and we did this exercise last week as well, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit. We all have manageable expectations of certain things in life. As we grow in life, we expect certain things. Those are called scripts. Our, we have our own daily scripts that we go through. When you pull up to the McDonald's drive through you give your order, you pull up, you pull up again, you pay, and then you pull up to the third window and you collect your food and your drinks. You know, you might check to make sure you have your ranch or your barbecue sauce. And then, you know, what happens if a person pulls up and through the drive through collects their bag, and then parks in the parking lot and goes back inside? What's going on there? Hold on. The thing is they probably, the restaurant probably forgot to give them something, right? Why would anybody park their car after going to the drive-thru and walk back inside? You can probably expect that or solve that issue or assume that issue because you've been in that situation. It is such a regular occurrence for you that you know what's going to happen, right? So last week we did some drawings about I, all I said in the team meeting was draw a sun, draw a picture of a sun. And so we each got a piece of paper and we draw a picture of the sun with no other direction. So you want to share some of them? You have the, the corner of the paper sun, you have the swirly sun, and you have, you know, I'm not putting, I'm just, here you go, have a nice day. I don't know why I'm doing this sun. So the script is a sun. We all know it's round. It has rays. Everybody drew it. We had one team member, she drew a picture of a boy because I did not clarify sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. So that is the script. Everybody knows that a sun has rays. Everybody's going to draw a circle. Setting that standard and knowing that is great. But what can you do to flip the script? Anna had a monumental moment where she had to go in front of the town and work to get you know this information for her sellers and she'll never forget it. And she just said herself, the basic transactions that run smoothly where you barely have any hiccups, those don't stick. It's the pits and the peaks um, where we earn our experience, we find our value, we really are driven to overcome, right? We're not giving up on the fact, we're going to the town meeting, we're gonna hold this deal together. Some of our scripts that we have in our lives make us feel comfortable. Others are stable or invig invigorating, right? I'm not gonna go to the spa and come out feeling anxious, I hope. I'm gonna go to the spa and come out feeling comfortable. That's my expectation. If I come out feeling anxious, that's a memorable experience that I don't wanna have again. So you wanna create memorable experiences for your clients and what does that look like to you? What is that for you? Most of our life expectations are neutral based off of the scripts that we've identified in our day-to-day -day life. So the science behind that is 
not all moments are equal or given a chance to be remembered. So emotional peaks get remembered and endings get remembered, right? You can have a totally neutral transaction until you get to closing day and you're like, oh, this was supposed to be a power of attorney closing. I guess this isn't happening today, right? So what are you going to do to create those monumental moments in a positive way for your clients? The science behind our 20s, why everyone reminisces about their 20s and how the music is the best in our 20s and our friendships are the best in the 20s and how we remember it so clearly is because our 20s are known as all firsts. It's your first time graduating, you graduate college, your first love, your you know first car that you bought yourself, you know, it's the first time you go to a concert with your friends without chaperones. It's the first time you travel all by yourself without your parents. Your 20s are so full of firsts that they become a larger portion of your life than any other portion. And even people in their 80s and 90s can clearly remember their firsts. Even people with Alzheimer's and dementia remember their youngest years over any other portion of their life. And that's truly powerful. So what are we going to do to create those monumental and memorable experiences? Holly. So I'm going to share a tragic, not tragic story, but a monumental moment in my life. Um, my mom passed away three years ago. It was pretty sudden, but we had time. So we got to get all of our affairs in the order and all that kinds of stuff. And when we went to the funeral, and the priest was speaking, our normal priest wasn't available that day. We had a substitute priest that had we had never met before and all of the things. And he said, Yvonne was a lovely human being. She was great. She loved to sew. She had quilts, all of the things. And she was always willing to listen. And at that moment in time, I burst out laughing. I was hysterically laughing, crying. My dad was now laughing. My husband was like, what is going on? This woman is hysterical in grief. My mom was not a good listener. My mom would talk your ear off all the way. Like when I would go on eight hour drives to wherever I was going, I would put her on speaker and we would just talk the entire time. She would tell you stories all the time. So this was a memorable experience for me. The priest was probably mortified, but it created a moment of clarity and a moment of positivity. We were all able to laugh about it together and joke about it together. And my mom, wherever she is right now, was probably like, I don't know who this guy is, but I talk all the time. So it was a really bright spot and something that was very full of what you would call the script of a funeral. It's something memorable for everybody. It was able to turn the entire thing around and there wasn't, you know, a dry eye in the house, but it wasn't because we were mourning. It was because we were laughing and sharing funny memories of how we couldn't get a word in with my mom over, over a period of time. So it broke the script and it created a lasting memory. Everything else of that time is a fog, except for that moment in time. Um, What's this have to do with real estate? What does this have to do with real estate? That's a great question. So when you are coming together and you are serving a client who is also having emotional ties to a home or a place or a location or they're moving or they're selling their mom's home or because they passed away or we're working with someone on their biggest transaction of their life, we need to absorb those emotions and be able to flip the, flip the script so that we can create a monumental moment in their transaction. So whether that's positive and you overcome it with them, or whether your transaction is falling apart and you're saving it for them, you are creating a lasting impact in how you do that positively and successfully will create business for you later on. Like, oh my God, Anna Powell saved this deal. She went to 42 town meetings, so I didn't have to. And I'm going through this and Anna Powell is my girl forever, ride or die. Even in California, I'm going to call Anna to make sure that she finds me an agent in California that's as good as her. Um, we have that all the time. If you have a mediocre experience where everything just goes as usual, par, how do we know that that agent is valuable? They just did the paperwork for me and it, and it was fine. I don't know anything else about it. What are you providing to your clients? Are you noticing that 
they're having a new baby and they want to move because they're expanding their family. Are we taking note of that and providing that value? Um, something that Stephanie Cox, our team leader, mentioned was if they put, pour all of their heart and soul into their nursery for their firstborn and it's a beautiful thing, she has the photographer go in there and take family photos in the nursery. And so they have a family photo of this beautiful nursery that they poured their heart and soul into and they have to leave behind because they're PCSing because they're going to Japan. And so now they have this to take with them when they leave the house that they brought their firstborn home in. So every transaction is monumental to our clients, but how do we make it mon monumental in our own experience? How do we create our value? How do you make yourself set yourself apart from others that's gained through experience and efficiency, right? You create efficiency through your experience, what to do and what not to do, how to manage your time and set your boundaries as you increase your transactions, your transactional load. And so if you're wondering how do I do that? It's about being flexible with yourself, taking notes and really reflecting on your time and how you can monetize your personal intrinsic value. So once you start gaining that experience, whether it's through research or podcasts or shadowing people on listing appointments, you can take that with you to your next experience and overcome the emotional buyer, seller, investor, or anything, and really create a peak out of it. So a personal story related, we all have our personal baggage going on, but we need to absorb everything and send things out professionally. But what can you do on top of the basic script of real estate, which is get pre-approved, house hunt, go under contract, due diligence, inspections, whatever in between final walkthrough closing. That's your real estate script. And yet every single transaction is different. So what can we do as agents to utilize our intrinsic value, our experience to create something positive and monumental that will have them name dropping us and when they're moving or name dropping us to their friends who are also moving here or getting ready to sell their homes. You want to be the, I got a guy or I know a guy person. You don't want to be the person that is, oh, hi, that's right. You are a realtor. You want to be the person that pops into people's heads. So what are we, what are we creating that pops into people's heads? How are you going to be the top of that list? Other than just, I write contracts. I get you through the contract. I get you to closing. Shake hands. A lot of our scripts here start for, for closing days. Our relationship with you doesn't end at the closing table. What can you provide past closing that keeps you memorable? For us, it's savings and value. Here in South Carolina, we have 4% taxes that you can apply for. And if you don't, your mortgage or your, your taxes go up significantly. That's our bread and butter here at the Cox team. We send out those letters regularly. We're constantly saving homeowners money four or $5,000 a year because we identify them, we save them the money, we walk them through it. That's huge for people who can't necessarily afford to have their mortgage payment go up to three, $400. That's how we flip our script. We follow, we provide that value to our closing clients. Um, we continuously check up on them. So now you're like, okay, my intrinsic value, I'm so happy that you're telling me what can I bring? I have to identify that you've given me nothing. I have to do it all myself. I want you to start with your monetary value. So if you track your hours for one or two weeks, do you work 20 hours a week? Are you farming? Are you prospecting? Are you paying for marketing? What are your expenses? If you work 40 hours a week and you average $5,000 a month, I'll say, just to throw it out there, you're making about $31 an hour in a month for your own self. If you can make yourself more efficient to where you work 30 hours a week at $5,000 a month, you are now making $10 more. You're making $41 an hour. So let's take your intrinsic value, what your hard stop is, and how much you make per hour. And all of us are real estate agents, and we've probably been at a final walkthrough, and the house is trashed. 
and you're there at 11, 10 o'clock at night cleaning that house when all you could have done was communicated and said, hey, buyer person, seller person, is a house cleaner going to come once this home is vacated? I'd love to schedule that out. So instead, you're spending two, three hours there cleaning a home that's closing the next day at your cost per hour, which is $41 an hour. So if you were there for three hours, you cost yourself $150. And most house cleaners will clean a home, room clean for $150, $200 an hour. So finding your intrinsic value, what you are willing to do versus what your cost per hour is, combining those together will create hard boundaries for you in real estate. We'll show you what you can do to make your time, take back your time, create those boundaries, create that structure, and then leave the rest to everyone else. If you're making $41 an hour, should you be painting the walls in the home or should you hire a painter to do that? If you're doing two, three, four transactions a month and now you're clearing 10 or 15K, I'm sure that's everyone's goal is to have a six figure year. That's $8,000 ish a month. Are you doing your own laundry? Some people don't want to do their laundry when their cost per hour is now $82 an hour. Can you hire someone to come in once a week for you and help you around the house at 20 bucks an hour? And your cost per hour, you're still making 60 bucks for your own self. So once you identify how to create an efficiency for your real estate career, provide those peaks because now you're efficient. You can say, what can I do better? What can I be better at? How can I provide this huge amount of you know, memory for my clients so that they continue to recommend me beyond this transaction? And that is not learned during an easy transaction, a smooth transaction, unfortunately, but it's how you see them through to the other side so that they have a memorable experience in a positive way. You can only do that through finding your personal worth, setting your boundaries, maintaining them, and doing that all with a person, you know, a professional and um, willing heart, I'll say, and a demeanor, right? So we've learned that being overexcited can sometimes, you know, set false expectations. We've learned that not setting proper boundaries, those awkward conversations in the beginning with a potential buyer can be difficult, but ultimately it will save that buyer time and heartache. It will save you time and heartache. And it provides that value that they may not have even known existed. And you will either win the deal or they'll walk away. But if they choose to walk away, you saved your personal time and you saved your structure, right? And that's what Allison spoke about when in her story about she knew that this, this person was looking at homes with four other agents that day. And instead of rushing out the door and being the best agent, she chose to take back her time, have a full professional conversation. And ultimately it won her that client over. So really harness the power of your experience really harness the power of your education so that you can take that and provide your own self confidently the value to other people. And those other people are the families that you're empowering to move, to confidently sell, to invest in their futures. And the only way we can do that is by taking back our time and realizing that in our future, our goal is to be valuable, whether monetarily or being that I know a guy. So for us, whether it's a closing gift or a closing cleaning or a home warranty, those are all our basic standards. Those are our team rays of the sun, right? We have the circle with the rays and we encourage people to provide those things to their clients. But what else can we provide as real estate agents in a saturated market full of real estate agents? Thank you, Erica. Any questions, anybody? Questions? 
Erica, you're on the social media channels. I'm sure we can find you, follow you, keep up with you. Um, thanks for all the wisdom that you shared with us. Alice and I had to go. She had four baby raccoons showing up at her house. So. I heard, yeah. We all know where we ring. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much. Um, we'll have this recording up. So if this was something that was touched you and, and impacted you, we'll have the recording so that you can go back and listen and check your notes and we'll be here next week. Um, and I don't know who's on next week because I'm not looking at my calendar. And, um, but it'll be great, just like it is every Wednesday. Erica, thank you so much. You're such a wealth of knowledge. And um, to the Cox team for being part of our network. We love you guys down there in South Carolina. And we'll see you guys next Wednesday. 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 Bye. Have a great one, guys.